Good morning and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of High Point, North Carolina and this week's online worship service. We are so glad that you have joined us this day. My name is Lee Zemer and I am the transitional pastor here at the church. Today we will be reflecting on the call of God for us to practice hospitality. Is there a difference between being friendly and being hospitable? And can you be one without the other? Well, we will see what the scriptures will have to say to us. Let me remind you that we have two in-person worship services every Sunday. Our first worship, a contemporary service, is held at 9 a.m. in our Family Life Center. And then we have a traditional service at 11 a.m in the church sanctuary. Now, due to the rise in COVID cases in our community, we have returned to asking that our in-person participants on Sunday mornings wear masks as a way to protect the vulnerable among us. But we are hopeful that this is only a temporary uh, effort. And of course, we will continue offering our online service each week for those who are unable to join us in person. But wherever you might worship with us, I pray that you will be blessed. So let us turn to this morning's worship. Please join together in our call to worship. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth. The Lord sets the prisoners free and opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down and loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers and upholds the orphan and the widow. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, you faithfully wait for us. Graciously reach out to us. We worship together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that from him we might know of our welcome that with him we might continue on our journey, that in him we might serve you and your people. And so we pray in his name and in the power of the Holy Spirit, ever rejoicing in your glory, almighty God, forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray together, confessing our sin before God. Lord Jesus, our Messiah, we confess that we often fall short of your design for our lives. We place heavy burdens on the shoulders of others, but are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. We do good deeds to be seen by others, but perform sinful actions in private. We love to have the place of honor at social gatherings and to be greeted with respect in public, but we fail miserably when we are asked to give praise to others or to practice hospitality. Forgive us, Lord. Renew our lives and inspire us to follow you in serving others. For Jesus' sake, amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn only Christ? And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone then who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Well, let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we come to you this day eager to hear from you. And so we pray that you would help us to open our hearts and our minds and our wills, that we would receive what you were going to teach us today. Lord, then help us to apply it to our lives as we go into the world to minister to others in Jesus' name. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. I have three passages of Scripture for us this morning. The first comes from Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 3. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them, those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. And then from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 18. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. But associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And then our third reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 to 42. Jesus is speaking and he says, 
Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. And whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of them will lose their reward. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the summer of 1984, I had just graduated from high school, and I was getting ready to go to college at James Madison University, and I was unsettled. While I had been a part of a very popular band that played nearly every weekend, and my class was only 78 students, I never really felt that I fit in with them. I had different perspectives and values than they did. And that summer, I wondered if I would even find a community at James Madison where I could find my place. Well, midsummer, I received a call from my brother who was working at the Norfolk Presbytery Summer Camp, McKamey Woods, near Williamsburg, Virginia. A counselor had to leave, and they needed someone to come in and fill in the slot, and he wanted to know if I wanted to come and help. So I agreed to, and the next six weeks changed the direction of my life. What I experienced was the warmest welcome of my life up to that point. And while I had already missed half the summer, the staff made a point to include me and befriend me. They made me feel an equal part of the staff from my first day. And through their witness, I truly experienced the welcome of God in a way that I had never before. That fall, I arrived at James Madison with a new desire to get close to God. Now, because of my experience at the camp, I sought out the Presbyterian campus minister who worked out of the First Presbyterian Church there in Harrisonburg. He invited me to come to a welcome picnic, and once again, I was warmly welcomed by my peers who loved Jesus and wanted to share that love. For the next four years, my college experience revolved around the Presbyterian campus ministry, and it was one of the keys to my deciding to go into full-time ministry. It was the hospitality or welcome of a handful of Christian peers that God used to take hold of my life, give me a place to grow, and call me to faith and ministry. Such is the power of true hospitality. In the New Revised Standard Version, hospitality comes from either the word philoxenia, meaning the love of stranger, or xenodecheo, meaning to receive the stranger. The Harper's Bible Dictionary defines hospitality as the act of friendship shown to a visitor. The New Bible Dictionary states that hospitality was understood as caring for the traveler and those in need. In Old Testament times, failure to provide for a traveler's needs was a serious offense, liable to punishment by God. And hospitality in the Old Testament was more than just a custom. It was a demonstration of the faithfulness of God. Now, in the New Testament times, hospitality was an important thing, too, because there were few inns and poor Christians could not afford to stay at them anyway. Persecuted saints in particular would need places to stay where they could be assisted and encouraged. So in summary, we could say that hospitality was the process of receiving outsiders and changing them from strangers to friends. Hospitality thus differed from entertaining family and friends. In our postmodern world, we talk a lot about being friendly to others, but being friendly is only a small aspect of true hospitality. So as we press into this idea of hospitality and how it includes friendliness but doesn't stop with friendliness, let me ask, how important do you think it is to have a friendly church? Well, I think most people would answer, it's very important. A visitor can tell pretty quickly if a church is not glad that they're there. If parking is easy, if greeters are helpful, if it's clear where the nursery and the bathrooms are, well, guests feel welcomed. 
if people go out of their way to speak to new faces and seem genuinely glad that the guest is present, they will say a church is friendly. In his book, Surprising Insights from the Unchurched, Tom Rainier lists the top reasons that unchurched people choose a church. And the top three are the pastor or preaching, the teaching or doctrines, and the third most important are the friendliness of members. 50%. Half the people who are going to join a particular church list friendliness as one of the keys to their choice. In a George Barna research survey of people looking for a church, friendliness to visitors is ranked as extremely important for 71% and somewhat important for 21%. You add all this up and you see that for 9 out of 10 visitors, the friendliness of a congregation is important. And this makes sense to me. Why would someone return to a place where they are not welcome? So it, it's clear that churches that we need to go out of our way to make guests to our service feel welcomed. But the truth is, friendliness in churches is not enough anymore. In our postmodern culture, more is needed, much more. People in this rapidly changing culture, especially for those under 40, are looking for connections and relationships that go far beyond smiles and handshakes. They are looking for friends who are willing to share their lives and with whom they can share their own lives. In short, what they are looking for is koinonia, which is the Greek word for a deep fellowship of meaningful relationships. In other words, they're looking for a community in which to belong. And there is a big difference between just being friendly and showing hospitality. Friendliness is being warm and sociable and pleasant. Hospitality is different. Hospitality says, come into my life. It says, let's do something together. Come over to my house. Attend this event with me. Join me for a cup of coffee. Come to lunch with me after church. Hospitality means inviting people into your lives and getting involved in theirs. When I arrived at James Madison as a freshman, they had a club day when all the different clubs on campus came out for recruiting new participants. And I looked at a lot of clubs that I was interested in, and most of them were very friendly. But it was the Presbyterian campus ministry that welcomed me, a stranger, into their community. They showed me true hospitality, and it changed my life. The church in the 21st century has got to become more than friendly. It needs to embody hospitality. So I, I want to make three observations about hospitality that arise from the scriptures that I read. And the first observation is that we must not neglect showing hospitality. Hebrews 13.2 says, Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that some have entertained angels without knowing it. Hmm. Literally, the Greek says, do not overlook the love of strangers or do not care nothing about strangers. You know, it, it is easy to overlook hospitality. We get so busy in our own lives with work and exercise and eating and charity boards, not to mention children and family, that putting the effort into something more than just being cordial and friendly seems beyond our ability. The truth is that it takes less energy to stick within our own circles of comfort than to engage others outside of our normal circles, even within the church. And yet the author of Hebrews sees the Christian life as this balance between Philadelphia, which is the love of brothers or those within your own circle of comfort, and Philoxenia, the love of strangers or those you don't know well yet. This verse seems to say, put yourself in the stranger's place and show hospitality as you wish it was done for you. Show hospitality as one who needs hospitality. And we neglect 
showing hospitality, when we stay within our safe circles of comfort and do nothing to invite new people into our lives. And this is especially true in the church. We neglect hospitality when we ignore those who are on the edges. But just not neglecting to show hospitality is not enough. Secondly, we must actively pursue hospitality. In a section entitled Marks of the True Christian in the New Revised Standard Version, Paul writes, extend hospitality to strangers. The Greek actually says, pursue the love of strangers or pursue hospitality. The Greek means to run swiftly in order to catch or to seek after earnestly. Actively looking to move out of our comfortable circles and engage people on the edges is what it means to actively pursue hospitality. It means to invite people intentionally into your lives. It is embodying the with me principle. It is inviting people to be with you when you do things in your life. I always asked one of my children to go with me when I was going to do work on a Saturday morning because I was investing in our relationship. In 2019, I, invented, I invited someone to go with me to the Big Air Show in Wisconsin. And I got to know him better and our friendship deepened. We shared hospitality. We need to be actively pursuing hospitality. And then finally... We are to show hospitality without complaining. In 1 Peter 4, 9, we read, Be hospitable to one another without complaining. And the Greek here means murmuring from discontent or grumbling. And it's sometimes translated outside of the New Testament as secret talk or whispering. This really addresses the grumbling which arises because hospitality might impose too burdensome a demand. You mean I have to leave my circle of comfort and my friends? I mean, you want me to include them in my neighborhood dinner? But my group has been doing this outing for years. Really, the antonym of this Greek word is blessing. In other words, true hospitality allows us to bless others. You, you see, you bless others by taking an interest in their lives and involving them in your lives. Being hospitable makes you a blessing to someone else. So you might want to ask, why do we do these? Why do we show hospitality? Well, Christ modeled this as a way of living. Jesus was always asking people to be with Him. He took Peter and James and John with Him to the mountain of transfiguration. When He withdrew privately to Bethsaida, He took the twelve to be with Him. When he was facing his death and praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus took Peter and James and John to be with him. And even on the cross, there were two who died with him. You see, Jesus welcomed people into his life, and he embodied this philoxenia, the love of strangers. Another reason we do this is it's one way that we welcome Christ into our midst. Remember that gospel passage. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Jesus said that when we welcome another person into our midst, we are in fact welcoming Jesus Himself. And the Hebrews passage says that by welcoming one we don't know well, we might actually be entertaining a messenger from God. And so you may miss a message from God if you neglect to practice hospitality. Another reason we do this is because we are promised a reward. Jesus went on to say, Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. You see, we receive a blessing when we're a blessing to others. We receive the blessing of the presence of, Lord, of the Lord when we are showing hospitality. And if we don't allow hospitality to become a part of who we are as a church and as individuals, the church will continue to lose relevance 
to the world in which it dwells. You see, it's a, it's a deep emotional, spiritual, and relational connection that people are looking for from their participation in church. They're not looking for an activity to fill up their Sunday morning. Gosh, there's so many other things to do that. They are looking for koinonia, community, true fellowship. And if we as a church don't get serious about practicing hospitality, we will become just a social club with religious overtones. My pastor friend Stan tells a story of teaching a discipleship weekend at a church and stressing this hospitality idea, the need for the church to shift from an emphasis on being friendly to an emphasis on being hospitable. After his talk, a woman in her 40s came up to him and said, you know, in our church there are four couples our age, and every year we spend a week skiing in Colorado. Recently, a new couple who is our age began visiting the church. Are you saying that we need to include them in our ski trip? We are a very tight-knit group. And Stan replied, you know, I can't say whether or not you should invite them to Colorado, but what I can say is that they will remain in your church only if you can find a way to include them in your personal web of friendships. Stan writes that six months later, he heard that the couple the elder had mentioned had left the church. To build community, one has got to be hospitable, receiving the stranger and showing love to the stranger. And let me tell you that hospitality is very powerful. In my first call to Lexington, Virginia, it was a new town. It was before I met my wife. I knew no one. And there was this one particular family that took it upon themselves to be more than friendly to me. They became hospitable to me. They constantly invited me to dinner, asked me to join them when they went to pick up their daughter from camp, asked me over to watch sporting events. They became a family to me. They did not neglect to show me hospitality. They actively pursued it, and they did it with loving hearts, even when I would miraculously show up for a pastoral visit around dinner time. <laughs> As we seek to build community in Koinonia, hospitality is the key. And my hope for our church is that we would become a community where this practice of hospitality becomes second nature to us. Let's do our best to be intentional. Let's not neglect. Let's actively pursue. And let's do it with love and grace and a desire to be a blessing. Let's reach out to those around us and invite them into our community and into our lives. And as we seek to do this, I have a few suggestions. I think creating an intentional Sunday greeting ministry would help us to grow in the practice of hospitality. You see, while we have ushers, we can work on truly developing a greeting ministry that goes out of its way to make the guest feel welcome. Another endeavor that I think would really strengthen hospitality is to encourage everyone to wear name tags. Now, I know this church has tried this before, and people were less than excited, but the truth is, our church is large enough that name tags make sense so that we can call each other by our names. You know, there's a reason why River Landing residents wear their name tags all the time. And quite frankly, if we can wear a mask, we certainly can wear a name tag. Another endeavor that I think would build on hospitality is this idea that Pastor Aaron has about a monthly supper club. It's where uh, people gather together for a once-a-month meal in someone's home. And while right now we're on hold with this project until the COVID numbers decrease, I think this is a great way to enable people to invite others who you don't know well to be with you. And finally, I think that we can develop an intentional approach to hospitality on Sunday mornings, which I call Friendship in Private ministry or hospitality in public. You know, we like our circles. We like our friends. We like catching up at church with those that we know. But this can sometimes come across as exclusionary. 
We need to be intentional about engaging people outside of our circles. Friendship in private, ministry in public. Remember that friendliness will change strangers into guests, but only hospitality will change guests into friends as we build the body of Christ. May God help us to grow in hospitality as the body of Christ. Thanks be to God and amen. Let us pray. God of power and love, you are with us in every circumstance of this life. We thank you for your steadfast faithfulness. We thank you for the gift of your peace, which comes to us even in times of chaos and fear, trouble and doubt. We thank you for your powerful arms of mercy, for your powerful word that comfort us even when we are afraid. We put our trust in you, for you alone can save us. Increase mutual understanding and a sense of unity in our community, in this congregation, in the church around the world. In our personal relationships, bring healing where there is estrangement and hurt. In our relationship to your creation, give us creativity and perseverance as we work to be faithful stewards of all that you have so wondrously made. Free from sin and alive in Christ Jesus, we pray without reserve for those people and places, circumstances and situations that weigh on our hearts and minds this day. We ask you to provide healing to the sick. We look to you to ease the suffering of those hurting in body, mind, and spirit. We plead on behalf of the long oppressed and for those still waiting for justice. We yearn for you to guide all of those in positions of leadership to make decisions that reflect your will. We rest in your compassionate presence, freed from sin, alive and awaiting the transformation you promise. We make our prayer in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In God's great goodness, God provides for what we need. As a way of responding in thanksgiving to this loving provision, we bring our gifts to God. And then God uses what we give to bless the world through us. Each one of us has an important part to play in how God chooses to meet the needs of the world. And so let me say thank you for your generous giving that allows us to continue the ministry of Jesus in the world. You truly are a conduit of blessing for the provision of our loving God. And so, let us bring the first fruits of our labor to God in worship. You may do this through the online giving links on our church website or by mailing them in to the church office. May the Lord bless these, our gifts. Was blind. 
Go forth in Jesus Christ to practice friendship and hospitality. Give help and hope to others. Share the good news and proclaim God's love to all. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.